Okay, welcome back to day three of Rebuilding My Playing. Uh, for those who have actually watched the first do two days, I, I hope you've gotten something out of it. I definitely know I'll be using these um, with my own students to kind of demonstrate how I practice. Teaching the skill of practicing is what I feel like I do basically all the time. Um, so it's, it's a hard thing to learn how to practice and I don't know that we ever explicitly teach practicing at an early enough stage in the process and so it always feels like the big task that you really have to master to make it is really just to learn how to practice effectively. So hopefully, um, at the very least, these can serve as a resource to those trying to figure out like where do you start in the practice room. So uh, anyways, day three, new day, um, feeling good. I've been looking forward to practicing all day. Okay, so why did I grab my cell phone? Let's be very clear. I have a very strict rule against social media while practicing. I think it's obviously very, very distracting, but cell phones are great in practicing if you're using your like tuner app or if you're just kind of timing certain exercises and just kind of keeping track of when you need to take breaks. So that's a-okay. Anything else is not a-okay. And so you can always put your phone on airplane mode if you feel like if you have tons and tons of notifications rolling in and that's distracting, just put your phone on airplane mode. Like really force yourself to close out the world. These are powerful resources, but they're also really, really powerful distractions. So we want to use them wisely. Okay. So, uh, new day, new read. This one is, um, I don't think I ever actually played on this read. I think I finished it and then never used it because it is really a live wire, which is kind of fun. So, as with every practice session, I'm going to start with the chromatic tuning. Let's kind of see where this puppy sits today. It can be very dangerous. I think myself, there was a period when I played on flatter reeds thinking, oh, if it's flat, then I won't be sharp. <laughs> the problem is if a reed is flat or sharp, but let's really address the flat side. If it's flat, you know that you need to go sharp, but you don't know exactly how much you need to go sharp. So this can be a very dangerous game to play because what we will do inherently is just start to bite down with our embouchure and that's going to create exhaustion and that's actually going to end up pushing you sharp. So I think playing on a flat reed is very dangerous and I recommend not doing it. I also don't recommend playing on a sharp reed and thinking, oh, I'll just relax into it constantly. Uh, that can also be very dangerous. It really is important to play on a well pitched reed and we pitch reeds in the reed making process. So don't, uh, of course we make micro adjustments all the time, right? But overall, and this is why I do a chromatic tuning, I'm checking how hard am I having to work to get this read in tune. And if, and, and if basically every note I'm having to adjust any more than a few cents, this read is not in tune, it's gonna be problematic for me. So time to either switch reads or make an adjustment to the read. So uh, based on what I've seen though, I am gonna just kind of just close down the tip. It's really, really open and I love to play with a very open aperture but not that open. So I'm gonna close down the tip just a little bit. Uh, I might cinch up the wire in a second here. I'm actually gonna do that chromatic tuning again just to see if this has worked. So that low G is on the flat side and that to me really indicates an overall re uh, 
read that as two flat. If my low G is flat, it's sitting flat. Yeah, that I'm just, I'm just trying to tighten up and smile. And I don't want to smile when I play. I want to frown when I play. So let me pause for a second and make some adjustments. So I rounded the tube and then I tightened my top wire just the tiniest bit. I do play on a two wire reed. There's a lot of videos on my YouTube channel and instructions on my website, the Sumi with you, if you're interested in learning about the two wire reed. So anyways, I rounded the tube and I tightened that top wire just a hair. Let's see where we're at. In general, it definitely brought the pitch up a little bit. It might still be a bit on the low side. I'm going to be very cautious. I'm going to play in this for a few minutes since this does appear to be read that I have never played on before. But I'm going to be very, very conscious of my armature, especially because I am coming back from an injury and from an, a, a long break. I do not want to get into a bad habit of pinching um, or creating tension in my armature. So I'm going to be very conscious. And if even in a few minutes I find myself tightening, it's going to be time to move on to a different read. So, uh, long tones. And yes, I do always start on that low B flat because I feel like for me, uh, the work is always, the bulk of the work that needs to be done is always on that bottom octave, you know, playing low notes in tune with perfect response. That is an essential skill. And I feel like in general, it's just easier to play really softly with really good response in the mid range and the upper range, but it's in that bottom octave. So I do always start. Now, the other consideration though I have is that if I'm playing uh, throughout a day or a week or whatever, and I'm noticing that certain notes I'm coming back to over and over again and they're out of tune, that's an indicator to me that I've started to hear the note incorrectly in my head. And so I'll take note of that, mental note, write it down so that next time I do long tones, I'll go straight to that note and figure it out. Okay, so now I've had three or four bumped starts, as I like to call them. So a start that bumps but doesn't actually sustain. So also keep in mind that this is uh, a newer read. I'm going to go ahead and thin the tip a little bit because it obviously just has too much cane on it. I don't want to work that hard. So I made, I made the read adjustment. I'm going to actually start over again from low B flat, see if I can actually do this perfectly. And yes, in practice, it is a goal to do things perfectly. If we can't do it perfectly in practice, we'll never be able to do it 
in a performance situation. I also want to talk a little bit, uh, I'm a huge advocate for the Kovar daily studies, which include the sustained tones and attacks. I am not doing attacks right now because again, I like to do things in a hierarchy. Right now, my emphasis in rebuilding uh, is, is on a lot of different things. And so I'm not doing um, the attacks, I'm just doing a sustained tone. I will eventually add attacks back in, but there's a really fine balance between feeling productive and uh, motivated and just feeling overwhelmed. And I know if I start doing the attacks you know, in these first three days, I'm, I'm going to frustrate myself because attacks are really, really hard and there's a time and a place for them and it's not on day three of rebuilding. But I do want to say again, the Simon Kovar daily studies and those sustained tones and attacks, that's really, you know, if you're in shape, that's where you want to be um, working on a daily basis is both your attacks, the attacks are crucial, and also the sustained tones. <laughs> I got to a point of satisfaction with the B flat and the B, especially if you've watched the first two days. I spent a ton of time on the B flat and the B. This really is such a great example of how investing consistently and doing the work does build on literally a daily basis higher levels of mastery. Now my C really feels like a mess, so I'm going to spend a bit more time on this low C. perfectly. And if I mess it up on the third time, I go back to one. And that's the rule of three in practicing. A bit of a bump. I mean, the sound sustained, but it wasn't even at the beginning and the pitch was very, very sharp. I'm not counting that. sharp side, also not counting that. Okay, 
response was good, nice and soft, but quite sharp when I started, so that's not acceptable. <laughs> okay, so now I feel like I'm doing all the right things, but maybe the reed's just not quite responding. Again, this is obviously a newer reed, new-ish, completely new, whatever. So I'm going to take some more cane off. So that was the best one so far. It the um, tone wasn't even, but it was a nice soft response. It did sustain, and uh, the pitch was basically where it was. Also, a good reminder to me that my attacks, spending time attacks, is going to be coming very soon because I'm really just having a lot of challenges with the attacks now. probably very very boring but that was really the best one I've done so far and think of how many times I've done that there is nothing magical about incredible instrumentalists it is just this it's just sitting in a practice room and with a tuner and a metronome on and just doing it over and over again and assessing what's going on where's my tongue placement where's my embouchure where's the read just trying to figure out all the problems so that you know where they are so that in the moment that you need to come in on a low C and it needs to be quiet and it needs to be in tune, you're confident that you can do it. You know where everything is set up because you've done it a million times in your practice room perfectly. I've done it one time. I've done it one time really. So when we think about great instrumentalists more than anything, it's the consistency to nail challenging aspects of playing, which doesn't mean super fast or super high. It means that every low C that has to be done at a triple C attack, they know they can do it because they've done it a million times in their practice room. That is the essence of building a strong foundation. 
Okay, so yesterday I jumped right into my thirds because I was thinking about it all day and wanted to tackle them. And I didn't do any of my scales. I just focused right on those thirds. And that was great. And today I'm really anxious to jump into those fourths because they were such a mess last night. But I don't want to miss doing all of my scales. So I'm going to play all my scales, just basic major, all of my minors. Um, I'm not going to do a Hertzberg with a turnaround all the way towards the bottom. I just want to play my scales. Should I do the Hertzberg? Probably. But again, there's a hierarchy of things I want to tackle. And um, yeah, I just, I'll get there. I'll get there. So nice slow tempo. I'm going to stay with 60 and I'm going to tongue 16th notes, all major and minor scales. doesn't have enough resistance in that super um, high octave, so I'm really pinching up with my embouchure. I'm going to stick with it though, but I'm going to mentally um, forgive myself for things that did stop responding in that top octave. I'm also going to switch. I've been doing kind of a diaphragmatic stop to all these articulated notes, so you're seeing a lot of movement because of my topography. It's very easy to see. Uh, I'm going to switch over and just basically do it, not a tongue stop, not like a, a jazz like saxophone tongue stop, but I'm going to stop kind of rounding the ending of the note with my diaphragm and just, just, just let the, the, wind, the air and the tongue stop. <laughs> articulations depending stylistically on what you're playing you want to be able to do both of those and you can develop both of them in your practice by simply saying I'm gonna round the end of the note with the diaphragm or I'm just gonna use my air and my tongue to stop the note but they're very very different sounds you should be able to do both of those <laughs> because now I hear it sagging on that middle C sharp. And I really now can't 
can't basically um, articulate anything above my high C. And so now this read I need to set aside. I, again, it's a new read. I'm sure I can fix it. Um, but I need to know what I'm doing. I, I need to know what is me and like what's the read. And so this has now become a problematic read. So moving on to a different read. So, especially when you get into the keys, so that's G flat, where you can't do three full octaves. When you don't do full range and do the turnaround at the top and go all the way to the bottom, it does feel a little silly to play a two octave um, scale on the bassoon. I'll get there. Oh, yeah, yeah, E flat harmonic minor. Wow, boy, if you're under the impression you can master something and not lose it, let me change that for you. All of these skills are distinguishable. If you uh, walk away from them for five weeks or longer, guess what? E flat harmonic minor will become a new mystery to you. just gonna play my major and minor scales and it's like there's a ton of stuff in there that has to be resolved I mean there's just a ton um, again I think about you know young aspiring student musicians how often they go into a practice room and play things poorly and don't stop and invest whatever time is required to to master the issue that they just play with errors over and over again, and then they go into their lesson and things fall apart, and they say things to their teacher like, well, I practiced so hard this week and I did so many hours, and yes, but what was the quality of your practice? Did you stop yourself every time there was an issue? Did you actually resolve the issue with consistency so that you could do it over and over again correctly before moving on? And I just think so many students don't do that. Um, which is not a criticism, it is, a, it is an observation of the challenges um, that music students face in having to be really highly focused. And again, let me say, the moment this gets involved in your practice session, I'm so grateful that when I was in my undergrad, this was not a thing at all. I mean, I had a cell phone and I could send texts, but like, it, it just was not a fixture. It, I mean, I was in my undergrad from 98 to 2002, and I had a, one of those like brick cell phones. I mean, this was nothing. This, this, was, this was absolutely not a part of my life. So when you add in just normal distractions, um, and you pair that with a student's inability to stop and actually fix issues, it's no wonder that some students just cannot progress in the way that they think they should because they're really not addressing issues when they're practicing. Stop and fix things. Thank you. 
Okay, the frustration is real. It is an F harmonic minor scale and it is kicking my butt. Which is, so it's a good time to take a break. So it's a good time to take a break, I'm gonna take a break.